bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all of the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Gosh, what a great Sunday to be in church. Baptism Sunday is my favorite Sunday of the year. I don't know about yours. And it is a joy and a privilege to journey with those who went through the waters of baptism. Just a couple things as we get started here this morning. First, if you haven't been baptized before, right? There, there's a tank on stage and we will find a way. And I mean that. I mean, this is an opportunity for you to take a step forward through the waters of baptism. Not only did Jesus declare it and command it, but then he modeled it for us by going through the waters of baptism. And then he commissioned all of us to go and do the same. And so if you have not been baptized or perhaps you were baptized as an infant upon the confession of somebody else's faith, but you've journeyed in life in such a way where you're, now your faith is meaningful to you and you'd like to be baptized on the confession of your faith. Even though we may acknowledge your infant baptism, we also recognize that this may be a journey that, that is just a progressive next step for you. We want to join with you in that. And so here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to put it out there and say, I'm going to be here at the front at the end. And if you'd like to come and say hi, I'd love to meet you. If we haven't met before, my name is Jake, the privilege of pastoring here at the church. But if you'd like to be baptized, we will find a way today. We've got shirts, we'll find shorts, we'll get it done. We don't want you to have to delay your baptism. And I mean that in the sense that any obedience that's delayed is disobedience. And so if you know that's a step that you need to take, we're going to find a way to do it. Like Pastor Ben said, we've got people in all of our gatherings today that are walking through waters of baptism. Last week, I was in Lee's Summit with our Lee's Summit congregation, talking to several afterwards that were going, oh, I don't know, I think I'm going to walk through. Listen, there's always fear, there's always anxiety on one side of the faith step. And there's joy and celebration on the other side of the faith step. That's how it always works. So please be encouraged and be willing to walk through the waters of baptism. Second thing I'll mention is you saw Aaron who was up here, Pastor Aaron, who was with the, the first two that were walking through waters of baptism. Pastor Aaron has been doing such a great job with our student ministry. She came in as an interim pastor and then stayed on in a part-time role, but has just recognized that the needs that are, are needed for her at home are just creating a challenge for her to keep pace with what she needs to do in student ministry. So she's going to be moving to a volunteer role. And you may remember that Pastor Joseph Padetti has come in as a full-time student pastor. And so she's going to be serving with our middle school students. That's where I believe she is right now, uh, still in the lives of many of our students, but under the leadership of Pastor Joseph as we move forward. Just want to make sure that that's clear. All of our students should know as well. All right, let's jump in to today text. We're looking at Psalm 23, continuing on in our series called Canyons, as we journey through this Lenten period toward Easter. And we're taking this scripture line by line, walking it through each and every week, understanding that some of life's biggest challenges that we face can seem overwhelming. And as much as we would all love to talk about our problems with one another, and we do, we recognize in church it's not about focusing in on our problems as much as it is focusing in on the character and nature of who God is. And that's because when you're on the valley floor of any problem that you're facing, in the shadows, when it feels like you're in confusion, you're looking up and you're trying to figure out where to go, you're just looking for the next handhold for somebody to guide you. I, I, I'm reminded, even this week, how confusion is in the midst of the darkness. 
Like I, I was thinking back uh, in my mind's eye this week to when I was six years old. I was brought over to my parents' friend's house playing with a group of other six-year-olds in the back bedroom. You know what it's like when you got six-year-olds. You just shove them in a back bedroom somewhere. Uh, at least that's what they did with me. And we were jumping up and down in the back bedroom on some sofas. This is in the 1980s. There's Formica on the sides of these sofas. So those of you who don't know what Formica is, this is like the laminate and the countertop that we used to use. And so it, it, these, are, these are not safe sofas. And of course, there's another six-year-old just flicking the lights on and off, on and off, on and off, creating a storm effect. There's loud music. I'm jumping up and down on the sofa and somebody pushes me in the back into the corner of this sofa. And I come out with a bruise on my chin. I can't see myself, but my parents give me that look like something is really wrong. I think my mom's got her head like this. My dad's just freaking out. So he puts me in his arms, goes out to the station wagon that we had and locked his keys in the car. So we get the old, uh, did did you guys do the old trick with the coat hanger to get the key? Yeah, so we're doing that in the driveway. We go 120 stitches later. I have a scar to never allow me to forget that confusion happens in the dark. And when that darkness creates confusion, it creates all sorts of chaos. A couple weeks ago, I'm on a plane. I'm sat next to a guy who said, hey, tell me your story. I like to meet interesting people. So I tell him my story. Then I said, I'd actually like to hear your story. He said, well, when I was young, I got into finance and I started my own financial services company and it became publicly traded. And then a few years ago, I handed it off and I got bored in retirement. So now I'm hopping planes again, starting another business. And I said, so tell me about your journey. What was it like going from nothing to publicly traded? What were some of the highs and lows? He's telling me, he said, the greatest challenge I had through my whole career was in the succession process, handing my business off to somebody else. I was so confused. I brought in three or four consultants over a 12-month period. We're trying to figure it out. He said, Jake, there is nothing scarier in life than trying to walk through the darkness. I recognize today that some of you may feel like that. We, we use the phrase being in the dark to describe not having enough knowledge or not having the guts to step over the line of fear into a new reality. Sometimes we talk about being in the dark because we don't know what somebody else is thinking or because we're not sure of our new environment. And so it causes us to step a little more carefully as we go. And as I said, our focus is not what are my problems as much as who is the one leading and guiding me along the way. And so we've been relying on the teaching text of Psalm 23, perhaps one of the most famous psalms, if not the most famous psalm, the psalm of confidence, the psalm of the shepherd, the psalm written by David, a poem 3,000 years ago to help lead us and guide us. And to help us in this journey, we're not just listening to these talks. We've got a daily devotional. Some of you are journeying with us in. But then we're also reciting Psalm 23 as a congregation each and every week, knowing we don't just want these words to get in through our ears, but also as we recite them through our mouth as well. And so, is everybody ready? Because we're about to recite Psalm 23. Everybody ready? Like three of you. Okay, this is going to go well. Come on, let's do this together. Psalm 23. Let's recite it together. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley... I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Now, we're taking this line by line, and so two weeks ago, we started this series by saying, the Lord is my shepherd, and we are reminded that every one of us is going to follow someone or something. We're going to follow a, a teaching, an idea. We're going to follow a person or a group of people. We're going to follow a nation. We're all prone to be followers. 
You're gonna follow something. Never forget, you will eat the fruit of those you follow. You will eat the fruit of those you follow. Whoever you follow, this is gonna generate something in you on the inside, good or bad or indifferent. But this idea of the Lord being our shepherd for David is about his acknowledgement of his situation. David remembered when he was a shepherd when he was young and he had his own sheep and now in the midst of his own crisis, he recognizes he is the sheep who needs a shepherd. And he sees God as the one who protects him, the one who provides for him, and the one who cares for his soul. And he says, when God is the one who protects you, provides for you, and cares for your soul, you can make this statement that's so countercultural in our world today that says, I need nothing. I lack nothing. Now, I know that's how you live, right? You never like to talk about the things that you lack because you lack nothing. Now, most people like to talk about the things that they lack. They say, I wish I had this. I wish I had that. I really need this. And, and that's just fodder. It's what we do on a daily basis. But when you have the Lord as your shepherd, David says you can make the declarative statement, you need nothing. Last week we learned that we need nothing because God nourishes our soul. He makes us lie down in green pastures. Like we just rest in the good stuff. God always supplies what we need. Then he leads us to still waters and the, the thirst in our soul is nourished by the way in which God orchestrates and makes it happen for us to experience the very best. And then he restores our soul or the Hebrew says he brings us back. He brings us back to what really matters. Sometimes we stray, sometimes we get off course, and God is constantly leading us back to what matters. And that leads us now to today's text, Psalm 23.3, that says, He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Now, he guides me. How does God guide us? Well, it's been said that God guides us in two different ways. Sometimes God guides us by leading us by the hand. And those of you who have journeyed with God for a long time know that sometimes that's easy and sometimes you go to where God wants you to go kicking and screaming. And on the other side of it, you go, thank God that he dragged me where I needed to go because he saved me from myself. I would have made a terrible decision. Anybody in the room, you would have made a terrible decision if God hadn't saved you from yourself? Yeah, the rest of you, you're gonna journey with God long enough to realize that's how God sometimes leads you. He goes, I'm gonna protect you from your own chaos. I'm gonna lead you where you need to go. And God leads us by the hand. Other times, it's as though God has already equipped you. That's why when you're in prayer and you go, God, what is it that you want me to do? God sometimes looks at you as if to be silent, but is, what he's really saying is, I've already given you the tools. Go and do it. You know what to do. Sometimes if you're honest, you may even be asking God, God, what should I do? You know what God wants you to do, but you don't really want to do it, so you're asking him for a different response. It's kind of like going to your dad and going, dad, what do you want me to do? And dad tells you to go clean your room. So you go, I don't really like that. I'm going to go ask mom. Mom, what do you want me to do? Go clean your room. What did your dad say? He said, clean the room. And you go back and forth because you know what you're supposed to do. You just don't want to do it. So it's been said, sometimes God leads you by the hand. Sometimes he gives you a compass. Sometimes you know the right direction. He's equipped you for what you need to do. You have to decide whether or not you want to walk in that or not. And then it says, he leads you where? Into right paths. Or as the King James said, paths of righteousness. This word right or righteous is the word in the Hebrew, sedek. And it means justice. It means having a right relationship with God. It means having a right relationship with somebody else. So we know this. We know that sometimes God's going to lead you like this. Sometimes he's going to lead you by giving you what you need. And he's always going to lead you into relationship with him, right relationship with others, and into paths of justice, doing what is right. And then what, what we learn after this is that he's not just going to lead you in two different ways. He's not just going to lead you into righteousness, but he's going to do it for his namesake, for his namesake. I love, I love what George Lamps says. He grew up in the Middle East and he understood shepherds by observing them. He said, the shepherd is very careful about the paths because he loves the sheep. And for his own name's sake, he would do anything to prevent accidents and attacks by animals. He has to keep his reputation as the good shepherd. In other words, God doing something for his namesake means he's putting his stamp 
of approval on the path that he's leading you on. He's saying, I'm going to put my reputation on the line that the path that I'm going to lead you in is good. I'm the good shepherd. I've got a reputation. I got to be careful where I lead people if I want to keep that reputation. And I promise you that I will always guide you into paths of righteousness and I'll put my stamp of approval on it. I'll put my reputation on the line. If you ever wonder whether or not God is good and because of the path that you're on, God says, I put my stamp of approval on it. So in summary, in summary, God guides us by the hand, equips us for what we need. God leads us into paths of relationship with him, relationship with others, and into places of justice. And he puts a stamp of approval on it and says, I'm the good shepherd. You don't have to worry. Now, all that sounds really great. But if we're really honest and we ended there, there would be some of it going, that's really nice theory, but I don't really know what that has to do with the one o'clock business meeting that I'm going to walk into tomorrow and how I'm going to navigate some moral conundrums. I don't know what that means when I'm in fifth period in high school and I'm trying to figure out how when a fight breaks out in the classroom, what I'm supposed to do with that or how I'm supposed to respond to a phone call from an extended family member talking to me about all the crisis that's going on. How do I actually live this out in the day to day? And, and, and so I want to help you with this because when you're in the dark, it's really hard to know which way to go, even if someone's pulling at you. And here's what I've learned. It's not as simple most of the time that God's just going to lead you. But when you're in the dark, it feels like five different hands are grabbing for you and trying to pull you in different directions. How do I know what the voice of God is in those moments? I want to help you by starting through this process of pointing you in the right direction. Look, God often leads us. In fact, he almost always leads us in circles and not in lines. He leads us in circles and not in lines. That doesn't mean that God's moving you backwards. But he moves us in circles and lines. So Middle Eastern context is helpful for this. Remember, this is the lens that David is writing through. He's thinking about shepherds in the Middle East. So let's go back in time to the Middle East just for a second. If you're on the valley floor in a pit and you're trying to get out, how do you get your sheep or your animals out of the valley and up the side of the mountain? Well, we would go, well, you just go straight. There's a problem with going straight up the mountain, and it's called gravity. Gravity doesn't work so well. Sheep are not like, uh, you know, like mountain climbers in the same way. I know that they've got some ability, but doing it all together. Instead, here's what we see in the Middle East. Here's the, here's the image I want in your mind. They go left and right. They zigzag up the side of the mountain. And by zigzagging up the side of the mountain, they're moving higher and higher through elevation by returning to where they once were. Look, this is how God often leads us. He leads us by causing us to return to places we've been before. Now juxtapose that to probably my favorite board game as a child, the game that I love to play with my parents on a Friday night, the game of life. Anybody like the game of life? You remember the game? Yeah, wow. Very enthusiastic about the game of life. So, so here we are with the game of life. And if you've ever played, right, there's a little car. It was always plastic. And there was these little things, pink and blue. And then you tried to accrue as many kids as you were because kids made you money in the game. Think about that. Kids made you money in the game. That has not been my lived reality, that kids make me money in the game. And so then you, you kind of spin the wheel and you go through and then you've got the option to like skip college, go straight into a career. Uh, you've got the option to like skip entire parts of your life. And the goal is what? To die quickest, like to get to the end first and you get extra money at the end right? And, and you'd accrued all of this. And then you sit down and you count up all the cash you have, all of the assets that you've accumulated, and you decide who wins. This is a very American Western view of how life works. We think about life in a linear way, about boxes to check along the way. Uh, check the college box, check the marriage box, check the kids box, hopefully check the grandkid box. Check the buy a house box. We check all these boxes in a linear way and go, I just need to get from here to here. And by getting from here to here, I'm going to, and maybe you've heard this term before, I'm going to win at the game of life. I'm going to win at the game of life. 
Life is not a game to be won. What, so you can get to the end of your life, you can die, and then look at all the other people who have died and go, I won. Is that how life works? I don't think so. And yet that's the narrative that many of us are working off of. So we use terms like I'm going backward in life. Or we use terms like I'm, I'm coming back. I'm, I'm like rewinding 10 years. I'm in the same place I was 10 years ago. As if these things are terrible because you should be progressing through the game of life. That's not what the scriptures teach us. The scriptures teach us is that God wants us to return to things, into a deeper relationship with him. Look, I want us to understand that the goal of life is not to win it. The goal of life is deeper relationship and reliance on God. It's to know him, to experience him. When I was a young pastor, and I'm a, I'm a little ashamed to say this off the stage, but it was so many years ago, so I apologize to everyone who had to listen to me way back then. But when I was a young pastor, I used to think in my head, I've got to come up with something that nobody else has ever heard before. Because if I don't come up with something that nobody else has heard before, what am I even doing? It was all about knowledge accrual. And the more that I accrued knowledge or could present knowledge to people, the more that they would somehow become mature Christians. I now realize after doing this, this summer will be 27 years of doing this thing. If, I, if I'm doing the wrong thing, I've been doing it a long time in the wrong direction. Okay? But I now realize, I now realize that life is not about accruing and moving on. Life is about returning to things. It's about returning to love. You don't graduate from learning about humility. You don't go, I got humility, figured it out, now I'm gonna move on. And you become prideful because you've learned about humility. I mean, like you, you instead return back to it because you forget. Life is not about learning about love and then graduating from it and moving on with the rest of your life. You forget. In fact, when I, when I really think about Psalm 23, I think about a passage of scripture I've read dozens of times, if not hundreds of times at this point. It's been a part of many of the services I put on it at people's celebration of life, memorial services. It's been a part of people's key moments in their lives. It's, it's text that I've preached before. And yet somehow, every time I return to the text, I see something new. I learn and I grow. My experience has changed. The people in my life illuminate something different that I didn't see before. It hits me different. And so the more that we return back to things going up and up and up, or you might say deeper and deeper and deeper, or higher and higher and higher, however you want to describe it, you understand that every time that I do and I return back to the same thing, I'm growing in my depth of relationship with God and others. I'm growing in maturity and I'm finding greater reliance and soul satisfaction in him. The game of life is not meant to be won by how much you accrue as much as it is to become more and more dependent on God by knowing him and experiencing him and having the richness that this life in Christ has to offer. That's the beauty. That's the beauty. I often say it this way. I say being brought back to where we began doesn't always mean failure. You must never forget that. That God may bring you back to the point where you are. Not because you failed the test, but because he's going to teach you something new about the same situation. And be patient with it. Enjoy it. There are not boxes that you have to check. That's a lie that somebody told you. It may be deep in your heart, but I hope that you understand God wants to meet you on a deeper level than that. It's important to understand God will not count how many Super Bowl rings your team has at the end of your life as much as it's awesome to win Super Bowls. Am I right? I also want you to remember that God will not define your life by how smart you are, how attractive you are, how wealthy you are, or how popular you are. Those are not the things that God values the most. The, throughout the years and, and centuries, the church in different areas of the world have tried to, 
to teach the church uh, a different way, an alternative way to how the world values things. And one of the most famous ones is the Westminster Catechism, which is, means teaching. It's a way of indoctrinating people and understanding what it means to follow Christ. It was a document created in the 1600s by English and Scottish theologians with the sole purpose of helping people understand who God is and how they should live their faith out. The first statement of the catechism reads, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The goal of your life is not how much I accrue. The goal of your life is not how much I have. The goal of your life is not how good or how wealthy or how popular I am. The goal of your life is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. It's not to make you more successful in life. You may be more successful or becoming more successful may actually take you out of the will of God. Instead, the journey of this life is about drawing you into a fulfilling relationship. That's why 1 John 5.20 says, We also know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. Why has he come? That we may know him for relationship. So never forget, we return to places with deeper truths, gaining a great perspective. In the remaining time that we have, and it's not long, I want to show you what it looks like to return to some of these places. Some of the things that God returns you to. The, the first thing that we return to is truth and discipline. We return to truth and discipline. When I say discipline, I don't mean like telling you off. God is not up there going, no, no, no. When I talk about discipline, I'm talking about the disciplines of life. Like returning to things like prayer and meditation, returning to things like scripture reading and community, returning to things like worship and engagement, like practices. We would say that truth informs you, but disciplines transform you. And so there's a, a truth and a discipline that God calls us to return back to on this journey up the mountain of whatever it is that we're facing. Every one of us is going to journey into these truths. John 16, 13 tells us that the Holy Spirit is there as the spirit of truth who comes and will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is to come. The primary way that God likes to lead us in truth is through the scriptures. And that's why we tell you, don't just read the Bible and go conquered that book onto the next, but return back to it on a regular basis and allow the truth of scripture to come to the surface in your life through what it is you're wrestling through. Spiritual disciplines, on the other hand, are going to form you into who you're to become. Prayer and Bible reading, fasting and feasting, Sabbath and community, they're all great examples. And God loves to bring you back to those practices. So we know truth and discipline are two things God causes us to return to. He also calls us to return back to love and acceptance. Love and acceptance. Friends, I realize that for some of you today, this idea of love and acceptance is nothing that you've experienced. You're in a hypercritical environment. All week long, you're told either at work or at home how terrible you are, what you've done wrong. You may even translate that into your relationship with God thinking, God doesn't love me because my Christianity is all about me falling flat on my face and then asking God to forgive me and then getting back up and then falling flat on my face and then getting back up and you're in this endless cycle where you never feel good enough. And if you came to church to hear anything today, if you're in that place, I want you to hear, you are loved and accepted by God. He loves you. He loves you. He accepts you. I've used this quote before, but it's so crystal clear. The late Tim Keller famously put it, the gospel, the good news is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. If you hear nothing else today, it's that. It's that, yes, in the brokenness of your life, you may feel like you don't deserve anything. And maybe that's true. But you are more loved and accepted than you could ever dare to hope. When you experience and believe in the love and acceptance that God offers to you, the guard tends to come down. When I feel attacked, when I feel like I'm not in a safe environment and somebody asks me to be honest, 
the shame, the guilt, the fear, the walls come up. But when I know that I can share the deepest, darkest places of my life and I'll still be loved and accepted even more so because of my honesty, the guilt, the shame, the fear, they drop. And there's freedom that comes from confession and being set free. And then it's easy because I know I've been forgiven because I know I'm loved and accepted and I come from that place to offer the same grace to somebody else. I can love you. I can accept you. I can bear your burdens because I know my burdens have already been bore. John 8, 7 says, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. This is Jesus' words to those onlookers who are judgmental because of their own fear, because of their own critique, because of their own worries and concerns. Jesus says, instead, would you just come to me and be reminded that you're loved and accepted, that I care about you? Maybe you needed to come to church today just to be reminded God loves you. As simplistic as it is, it's revelatory when we're not in that place. And finally, God calls us to return to tests and trials. Tests and trials make us and form us. We're formed in the fire. We're shaped by our adversity. If you're not currently in a test or a trial, good news, you will be at some point in your life. James 1, 2, and 3, we're reminded, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Don't think that because you're in a test, God loves, loves you any less. Remember that the tests that are allowed to take place in your life are there to form a perseverance and a strength and a tenacity inside of you to overcome whatever it is that you face. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test of time, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Never, never forget God will use trials in your life. It's not a punishment. It is part of your character formation. Enjoy the journey. I know that trials aren't fun, but enjoy the journey, understanding that there is a deepening, there is a tenacity. It's like going into sports and those two-a-days that'll crush you because you're running and running and running and you can't do any more and then you run a little bit more. That's what's going on inside of you, inside of your spirit. There's a strengthening that's coming. It doesn't change that you're loved and accepted. You are, but God will return you back to these things. So sometimes... He will return you back to truth. Other times, he's going to return you back to disciplines. Sometimes he's going to return you to love. Other times, to places of acceptance. Sometimes he's going to turn you into trials. And other time, into tests. But as you journey up the mountain, returning back and forth, may you be reminded that it's not about how much you accrue and how successful you come. As one author said, at the end of the game of life, all the pieces go back in the box. So may you be reminded today that the way in which God seeks to form you, to equip you, to mold you, and to make you is into a deepening relationship with him. And he will guide you into right paths and he'll put his stamp of approval on it. So what about you this morning? For you, is it that you need to be reminded to step back into a discipline? To step back into the truth of who God is? For you, is it about the reminder that you are loved and accepted because you don't feel it right now on the inside? Or is it for you, the simple reminder that the test and the trial that you're in is not only not the end of your story, but can be used catalytically to propel you forward into your future. I don't know. But what I do know is we're going to give some space to respond and give you the opportunity in prayer and in meditation to search your heart, allow the Holy Spirit to work, and allow the words that we've spoken today to meditate and to transform each and every one of us. Let's pray together. Father, we want to hear from you. We need to hear from you. But sometimes we also recognize that hearing from you 
is just a byproduct of walking in relationship with you over and over and over again. So God, as we take this moment to journey together, we recognize that God, life can be so confusing. We don't know what to do. We don't know where to go all the time. We feel like there's so many poles in different directions. And if we're not careful, we'll eat the fruit of the wrong person that we're following. And so Lord, would you help us to see the right path? We thank you for always leading us along right paths. We say thank you for returning us to a deepened walk with you. We know today, God, that the truth will set us free, that love is a foundation of all things. And we know that tests and trials propel our faith into deeper spaces. And so we're just simply asking that you would teach us, mold us, make us, remind us that as we return to all these things, you are perfecting something beautiful in and through us. We take time to respond now. We love you. We trust you. Amen. Amen. All over this place, will you stand?